Bring your wife with you. Just come on up. You can just stand next to him. I won't make you say a thing. Just come on up and stand next to him. All you have to do is nod. <laughs> Hallelujah. It is impossible to um, place before this congregation night after night the miracles that are taking place here. You, um, they're documented by, you know, the newspapers come in, they, they, they hear the stories, they write as much as they can. Uh, we, we try to put as much as we can before you, but I want you to understand for every one that you hear, there are thousands that you don't. Amen. It's just, and, and this story, he just came up to me a few minutes ago, and I've had people come up to me and say things like, by the way, I was dying of cancer and I've been healed. You know, things like that. And, uh, and it's like a by the way thing, you know, and I'm going... That's not a by-the-way thing. That's a testimony, you know? And we've had major, major testimonies of, of tumors shrinking and disappearing that with documented evidence from the doctors, and people just come up and they go, uh, you know, I was healed. And I go, what of what? You know, and they say, it's about the size of a baseball inside of me. And friends, if that's happened to you, you need to talk about it. Because there's some folks out here that need to hear it, and I want you to share just what, just what happened. I can tell something's happened here. Hallelujah. Just share, what, 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 just the way you shared it with me. Okay. July the 15th, uh, my wife had uh, had a, a situation where her ex-fiance had been calling her for seven years and saying how much he loves her and how much he can't live with her. And he's got a ministry, that they got a ministry they needed to be together and that she was tormented and taunted and she'd been dealing with this for seven years. July the 15th, she left me and went to Birmingham, Alabama with, uh, with uh, this, this man. And uh, come to find out, this man was not the minister that she thought he would be. He was doing two bags of uh, marijuana a week, thinking it's okay to love the Lord and doing pot. Well, I was torn and terrified. And my best friend sitting back there said, you need to go to Brownsville Revival. I says... <clears throat> Okay, I've heard all about it, but uh, I've been born and raised in the Assembly of God. I've, I've been, uh, I've had received the Holy Spirit when I was a young child. And uh, my best friend sent, took me there the very night that she left. I was tormented. I've had, I had four preachers come to my house, pray for me. Didn't feel nothing, but I came here uh, that Sunday night. Uh, uh, she left on a Saturday, and I came that uh, Saturday night. And God put me, laid me out right on that floor right there. And I didn't say nothing, and I didn't. I was just just getting caught up in the Lord and everything. And some brother and I, and I, I don't even know what he is or where he's at. I couldn't tell you what he looked like, but he coming to me, and I couldn't even tell you what I said. But I, I didn't even say nothing to him. And he says, "God told me he's going to heal your marriage." And I mean, he, I, I didn't say nothing to him because I was so broken. And he said, "God's going to heal your marriage." Well, I kept on and kept on and just kept praying. And and, and this guy called me. Friday after the lead and says, well, I've been trying seven years to get your wife, and now i got her, so take that. Well, of course, that, that tormented, but I kept coming to the Brownsville Revival, kept from coming to the Brownsville Revival. This is my 32nd 30 second 30 time. 32nd time. 30 second time coming. <laughs> and most of us... Wait, wait, y'all need to hear that. Some of you that come twice, you know? Yeah, boy, I've gotten all I can handle. I've been twice. Get real, man. Go after God. You go after God. So I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm interrupting because I'm interrupting right now. And it's, you go after God because some of you get touched in the revival and you just go, well, that's, man, this is incredible. Then you go off out there, friend, hell's out there fighting you. And here, some of you live within an hour of this revival. People come, we have people from, we got a group from Winnipeg. Where are you at from Winnipeg here tonight? They, they, they come in. People come in from all over the world. They come in from all, the Uni all over the United States. They'll spend thousands of dollars to get here. Some of y'all live within an hour, and you can't seem to make it. You know? I want to tell you something, friend. You're going to be one of those at the end of uh, when, when the Lord comes back, and you look back, you could have been in one of the greatest awakenings that America's ever had. This is going to spread across the nation. You need to get here. You need to be here as much as you can. All right, where were you? And now, 
Uh, but afterwards, uh, I kept seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord, going through some counseling, talking to a, a pastor and everything. Went to, uh, about August, I believe it was the 15th, my wife called me. It was the day before school st uh, started. She was depressed, really depressed. I really didn't want to talk to her because I was really angry. I felt a lot of anger and hurt. I had taken a half a day off to be with my son, took him swimming, felt anger. And when she called, I, I didn't really want to say nothing to her. She want, uh, so she spoke to my son, and then she really wanted to speak to me. So she talked to me. She told me, I love you. I'm sorry for everything. I'm sorry for hurting you. And she was so depressed. And I said, what did what, you say? God had been dealing with me, even though I was away and I had done what I had done. God still kept his hand on me. And what I did was wrong. It was sin. But I'm going to tell you, we have a great God. No matter what you do, you cannot run from God because he has his hand on you. But he told me, if you do not go home this very night, I will take my hand off of you. And I knew he meant business because he had been merciful. The very day I came home was the day Allison gave her testimony. August 8th thing. But I, I told her, I, I, the night before she called, I just said, hey, honey, I, you know, and I wanted to just, just tell, call her every name in the book and everything. I said, honey, I'm just going to give you some scriptures. I love you. If you want to come home, you call me, and I'll come pick you up. And she called me that next morning, and I went to Birmingham, Alabama to pick her up. So I'm telling you folks, if you got problems in your marriage, God is a healer. God will heal your marriage. Yes, Lord. God bless you, man. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something about marriage situations. I had a, <clears throat> years ago when I pastored in Georgia, I had a man come by my office one day. I, I was in my office doing some work, and he, I heard him talking to my secretary out in the foyer. He said, is a pastor in? And she said, well, he is, but he's busy. And something just prompted me to tell her to send him on in there. So I could hear her talking to him out there. And I, I opened the door and I said, what, what do you need, son? <clears throat> he worked for Pittsburgh Plate Glass Company. And uh, he was an official there. And he moved down from, from Pittsburgh to the area where we pastored. And he said, uh, he started crying. He started shaking all over and started crying. He said, my wife has left me. He said, she's left me with another man. He said, she's left me with a man that I work with, and she works out there also. And he said, they've run off together to California. They've taken my daughter. And out of my mouth, normally, you know, I would just be very diplomatic and very middle of the road, you know, not try to overly encourage him, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen. But God just gave me a word, just filled my mouth with a word from the Lord. And I said, son, your wife is going to come home. And I said, the Lord's going to give you a great miracle in your home. I didn't even know this man from Adam. Well, sure enough, it was about three months later, she came home. She called and asked him if she could come home. She said, I realize I've made a mistake. And he told her, by the way, I led him to the Lord. And he told her, he said, well, listen, things have changed since you've left. He said, I've given my heart to God. And he said, if you come home, he said, we're going to serve God. He said, I don't want you pulling me back out in the world. He said, I, I've made up my mind. I've got peace. And he said, if you're going to come home, he said, I've got a right to put you away scripturally by what you've done. And he said, if you come home, we're going to serve God. She said, I'm ready. She came home, gave her heart to the Lord, and they had a little girl that was almost blind. She wore glasses that was like Coca-Cola bottles. She was almost blind. That woman got saved, and when she got saved on Sunday night, the power of God is one of those great services where the power of God just exploded like dynamite. And the Lord had her bring that little girl up for prayer. And it's irrelevant who prayed for her. But the Lord brought her up, or she came up for prayer, and the Lord healed that girl that night totally. Here's what she said. <clears throat> Here's what the little girl said that night. She said, Mommy, I can't see with these glasses. She said, I just can't see. And this little girl was just a little bit thing like that. And the mama said, well, honey, take your glasses off. And she took a glass. She said, I can see. I can see. <clears throat> that man, and I'm just telling this as it comes to my mind, because as they was giving their testimony, I just want to tell you that the marriages today are suffering onslaughts of hell coming against them. But our God is greater. I'm telling you, folks, he's greater. 
And you don't know, you don't know what the devil is doing to people to tear their homes apart, but God is greater than the devil. And I remember that man after the Lord healed his daughter. He was so moved that night. He had just paid off a Pontiac automobile that he had, just paid it off. He was so moved. He said, I've got to give God something for what he's done. I said, son, you can't buy what the Lord just did for your daughter. He said, no, I can't buy it, but I can certainly give to one of his people. And he said, anybody in this church that needs a car, that don't have a car, he said, come and get these keys. And a woman in the church that was an ex-Catholic nun that God had saved and filled the Spirit, we baptized her in our baptismal pool. She walked up there and took those keys, and God gave her a car. <laughs> Folks, listen. When God, <clears throat> when God begins to work in a family, God begins to work in a home like that, it's just a chain reaction, one thing after the other. Last night, the Holy Spirit gave me a word for somebody that was here. I said, there's a woman here. I said, you're, you're, you're thinking about divorcing your husband. You haven't even told him yet. But I said, the Lord says to hold off. He'll give you a miracle. Last night, we got through praying around the prayer table over here. I walked down off the steps, and there she stood. She said, I walked in this church tonight. She said, it's my first time. And I said, God, I've heard about that revival. And she said, you know that I can't take it in the home anymore. And she said, unless you give me a miracle. I'm going to divorce my husband. I'm going to tell him I can't take it anymore. And she said, you've got to tell me tonight what I've got to do. She came in that service last night, and the Lord gave her that word. Is God a great God? Is God a great God? I'll tell you what we're going to do. If we've got just a few minutes, let's take time for about three or four good testimonies. I want to interview these guys here from Winnipeg. Come on out, fellas. All these guys that you saw come out here a while ago and start dancing in the aisle, these are all senior pastors. Come on out. I had, I had lunch with these guys the other day, and, and uh, they're all senior pastors, except this fellow right here in the blue jeans. Which, which blue jeans? Except this guy right here. He's, he's, a, he's a youth evangelist. These guys came down here from Winnipeg, Canada. How'd y'all hear about this? How'd you hear about the revival? How did we hear about it? I think through Bob Leslie, one of the pastors. One of the uh, pastors from the Toronto area, in association with the Toronto uh, Airport Christian Fellowship, uh, is a friend of mine, and uh, we made the connection through. Why don't you all come down here all together? Uh, it's, and I understand you all are all friends. You pastor different churches in, in, in the city, and you're all good friends. But how would you, how'd you wind up coming down here? What did you come for? More of God. <laughs> we haven't had enough. Uh, we're greedy because we're needy. So that's why we're here. Say that again. We're greedy because we're needy. So. <laughs> What? As, as a pastor, as somebody that pastors sheep, God's sheep, and knowing all the things that churches go through and church people go through and pastors and pastors' wives go through, what is it you're looking for from the Lord? What is it you want to see happen in your church? I'm going to pass the mic down and let you just tell one by one. What is it you're looking for? What, what do you want to see God do in your church? Oh, we've experienced some of the renewal in Winnipeg, but we want to see revival. We want to see unsaved people brought to Christ. Uh, we've been praying for two and a half years that God would smash the walls off our church and that literally impact our community with the glory of God and just that souls would be saved. We're hungering, hungering, hungering for souls to be saved. We have uh, about 25 or 30 pastors, all from different denominational churches that meet every single Monday morning to pray together. And we've been meeting for 10 years like that and been praying for God to move in our city. And we've all, we've all been to Toronto, some of us several times, to taste the renewal. But what we heard about Pensacola was the lost were being saved and coming in by the hundreds. And we said, that's what we need. And that's why we're here. Hallelujah. Our city right now is uh, under threat of a flood, and this hasn't happened for about 40 years. And we uh, have been given a number of prophetic words, and one of them was that there would be a break in a dam, and that would be a sign that in the spiritual, God was going to move in our city. Right now, the river is uh, four meters higher than normal. It still hasn't peaked yet. And we believe it's a sign that God wants to pour his, uh, the river of God out of the church into the streets. And uh, we, 
We actually were praying today, uh, Pastor, and, and we we're asking for a couple of things. One is that we would take back the anointing of the evangelist and that this, the preaching and the steering of the river of God would be turned towards the lost. And also that, uh, that we would take back the grace that you've had on your life to release the evangelist and to share the ministry with the evangelist. I want our churches to be uh, like the house of Capernaum where they let the man in down through the roof and the paralyzed come in and the blind come in and the wheelchairs come in and the sinners come in and they're healed and forgiven in one moment. I want to see a generation one for Jesus. Our church has been very needy, and we've uh, turned inward. We've been trying to get healed, and, and our focus has been inward, and really we need to focus outward. And uh, I really appreciate the heart for the loss that, and the passion for the loss that, that's here, and that's one of the things we want to take back. I want to take back to our church, but we want to take back for our city. One of the premises on which we just planted a church a year and a half ago was that God would give us his heart for the poor and the lost, and uh, that's what we're looking for. He's also said that I'm to be a fire starter, so I come down for more matches. Let me tell you something. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. I think what God's doing now is... Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night services are becoming a thing of the past. With what God is starting today in America and around the world, when revival breaks out in your church, Pastor, don't, don't kill it. Don't kill it and say, well, we'll see you all next Wednesday night, because you may come in next Wednesday night if you're calling the shots, and it may, that dove may have flown. Once it starts on Sunday morning, breaks out, like it did here on Father's Day morning, once it come through this place, don't damn it up. Don't block it. Don't inhibit and obstruct what God's trying to do. And I've said it so many times, and I'll say it again tonight. This church reminds me of a combine in the fields at night with the headlights on getting in the harvest. That's what it reminds me of. And I know I say that a lot, but every single service when we come in here and these altar calls are given and people come by the scores, sometimes by the hundreds, we've had 500 sinners saved at these altars many nights, many nights, first time. We started the services back up on, on uh, uh, January the 5th. There was 5,000 people here that night on the premises. You couldn't get them all in here. They were standing in the halls. They were standing in Sunday school rooms where there was no closed-circuit television, and there was over 500 people got saved that night, probably around 600. We're, we try to be very conservative. And you see these people come. Many of them have come prostitutes off the street, we built this church here. People, I had, I had business people tell me, they said, Pastor, you are crazy for building a multi-million dollar facility in this neighborhood. Don't you know it's full of prostitution and drug addiction? I said, sure, sure. But you know what? If the light moves out, the darkness will move in where the light was and take it over. And let me tell you something. Folks, we're not trying to impress anybody. We're not trying to impress anybody. This church is a multi-million dollar church in probably the worst area of Pensacola. But you know what? It so impressed the drug dealers and the prostitutes and all the people that's, you know, the street people, it so impressed them that they don't mark graffiti on our parking lots, they don't spray paint our walls, they don't break into this place. They respect it because we stayed here for them. And you know what? Because we stayed here and build this beautiful church, and we try to keep it immaculately manicured, try to keep it up, because I feel like that the property of God ought to be the cleanest, most well-presented place on the whole block, in the whole city. And we try to keep everything up, 
we're very, very picky about keeping everything up because God's name rides on that sign out there by the road, Assembly of God. And we want it clean and presentable. But it so impacted this city that when the paper came out here for our dedication, they said, well, why did you stay and build this nice church here in this location? Most churches would move out to the interstate or somewhere else like that. And here's what I said. I said, we're not here for the community to change the church, but we're here for the church to change the community. And you know something? When the Holy Ghost breaks out, don't stop him, but keep going by faith. And guys up in Winnipeg, if the river's rising in the natural, you can bank on it. It's rising in your church. And you know something else? Who knows but what God sent you to Pensacola for such a time as this, because the river's rising here also. And how many of y'all, since you've been here, how many of you, know, you know what I'm talking about. We talked about it at lunch the other day. How many of you have felt the glory, that glory blanket? Have you felt it? Let me see your hand. As God lets that glory blanket come on you, you're just absorbing and soaking in the presence of the Lord. When you go back, what you've absorbed in will come out of you, and it'll touch those people. Let's tell you what, let's everybody stand. There's a lot of other pastors here tonight, too, but these guys, they touched my heart the other day when we had lunch. I've never seen such camaraderie and senior pastors in one city that meet together for 10 years. How many of you? About 30 of these senior pastors meet every Monday morning for 10 years praying for revival for Winnipeg. Let's pray and extend our hands this way and ask God to send mighty tidal wave, a mighty flood of revival to Winnipeg. Woo! Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Ruth, come here, honey. How many of you have read the book Glory? The author of that book, Ruth, is with us tonight from Jerusalem, Israel. Would you welcome her? a wheel within the wheel <clears throat> and it's turning in me it's turning in me it's turning in me there's a wheel within the wheel and it's turning in me it's turning glory sing with me there's a fire within the fire and it's burning in me it's burning in me it's burning in me there's a fire within the fire and it's burning in me it's burning in the glory i can 
see. I can see, declare it. I can see the glory. I can see the glory. I can say the glory. I can see. I can say. I can say the glory. I can say the glory. Lift it up a little bit for me. I usually do it in set C. No, I do C. There's a wheel within the wheel. And it's turning in me. It's turning. Within the wheel, and it's turning in me. It's turning in the glory. Amen. There's a fire within the fire, and it's burning in me. Let it burn. It's burning. Within the fire, and it's burning in me. It's burning in the glory. Declare with me, I can see. I can see. I can see the glory. I can say the glory. I can see the glory. I can see. I can see. I can see the glory. I can say the glory. I can see it in Winnipeg. Sing, I can see. I can see. I can see. I can see the glory. I can see the glory. I can see the glory. I can see. I can see. I can see the glory. I can see the of the Lord shall blow. <laughs> yea, the whirlwind of the blow, Lord, shall blow. The whirlwind of the Lord shall blow, and thou shalt see the glory. Yea, for thou hast only felt the little winds uh, as they have blown. But yea, there is an acceleration. Yea, there is a great acceleration. Yea, the wind is increasing. And even as the winds increase, so are the waters increasing. And even as the waters increase, so shall the miracles increase, saith the Lord. For this place shall be even known as the pool of Bethesda. Such miracles, such miracles, such miracles beyond any miracles that you have seen or experienced hither to before. Yea, such miracles, yea, for this place shall become the pool of Bethesda, and they shall not even need to step forward to the front, but when they shall step into the building, they shall be healed, healed and delivered, healed and set free. Yea, they shall be healed, set free, delivered, 
changed, transformed by the mighty power of God. An increase, an increase, an increase of the glory, an increase of the glory for the wind beginneth to blow. The wind beginneth to blow, and it shall increase and increase and increase, and thou shalt be carried away into realms that thou hast not experienced hither to before. Yea, lay thy reasoning mind aside, saith the Lord, and let me carry thee away by my spirit, that thou mayest see the miraculous even as I intend for thee to see, saith the Lord, he cut up a she and I. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Lord. Yes. Lord. Yes. Lord. Hallelujah. I think, Pastor, when I was here before, I heard you say that there's hardly a time that you walk down that you don't feel the water. Not, not a time. And when I was in Jerusalem recently before coming, I saw this whole place become the water of God for miracles. Amen. People have come for revival, but I tell you, they're going to come in the future for the miraculous. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, a realm of creative miracles beyond anything that all of us have witnessed, and we've all seen great things. But this new day is coming in. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's just sing that chorus once more. I can see the glory. He is the glory among us. Amen. I can see, I can see, I can see the for this brother tonight. First time I ever saw an angel do the catching. And I saw a great angel behind him catching him. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know, I know there's a great thing that God's done. This brother, he kept going back and forth. I don't know if those that were watching, I was watching afterwards because I saw the angel catch him. Oh, hallelujah, Winnipeg's not gonna be the same. <laughs> Winnipeg's not going to Glory. <laughs> Woo. You may be seated. I want everybody to listen to me. Everybody listen to me, please. Monday night at 7 o'clock. This week we're moving our prayer meeting from Tuesday night to Monday night. Next Tuesday night begins a major conference here at this church, a pastor's conference, a minister's conference. There's going to be pastors, evangelists, missionaries, and their wives from all over the world in this church. 
This place is going to be full. We are at capacity for this sanctuary, but anybody that wants to come will be free to come, and we'll work you in. There will be places for you to see the service and to experience the service, but as far as the capacity that we had for the pastors that were signed up, we've already reached capacity for the pastors. They're coming from all over America. I think they're coming from all 50 states. I think there was coming from all 50 states except two, and that was before we got all the mail in, but now they're coming from all 50 states, and they're coming from different places. Paris, France. They're coming from Canada. They're coming from Australia. They're coming from Africa. You've gone to different places. They're coming from all over. But this coming Monday night, we're moving our prayer meeting from Tuesday night to Monday night, and I want a thousand people in that prayer meeting. I need a thousand prayer partners because we're going to have 1,500 pastors. They've already signed up. 1,500 have already signed up. It's definite that they're coming, and I need a thousand prayer partners this coming Monday night. And I'm going to be making this plea tomorrow to our church, and I'm sure that our church will going to have great participation from them. But anybody here that's a Christian and you want to come and join us and help us pray specifically for this conference, could I see your hand, please, if you'll make sure that you're here this coming Monday night. Could I see your hand, please, all over the building. Thank you so much. And I'll make this plea tomorrow to our people also, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of them here. Up in the balcony, I mean up in the choir area. Okay, great. Don't forget this coming Monday night at 7 o'clock for prayer meeting. We're believing God to give us a, a tremendous conference for these pastors and these ministers and their wives. I believe God's going to do some great and mighty things. We've been praying about it for a long time. We've been doing intercession for it for a long time. The devil has really fought this conference every way that he possibly could. But we're believing God for a tremendous breakthrough because if you touch that pastor, you touch that church. If you touch that evangelist, you touch those congregations and those people that they minister to. So we're believing God for a tremendous outbreak of the Holy Spirit this coming Tuesday night, this coming Monday night. Brother Richard's coming to receive our offering. I mean, will you worship the Lord with me this evening as we just thank Him for the privilege to give? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. You know, the Scripture says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen? Bless the Lord. In, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 10, you don't need to turn there, but there's a wonderful story that I love. It's a story about a godly man named Cornelius. And Cornelius, the Scripture says, was known for, two, or, well, for a couple of things. He was a very devoted and God-fearing man. But he was a man noted especially because he was a man of prayer and a man of giving. This man was constantly giving to the poor. And in Acts chapter 10, he has a visitation from an angel. We see angels in this place all the time. Angels are constantly here. Angels, the Scripture t teaches us, they, they are sent to minister to God's people. And angels are released in this place constantly to minister to your needs. And once again, I just, I, I just feel very impressed there are many of you, 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 you're here tonight, and it's like, if only, if I could only just believe that God would heal this inner healing. I'm telling you tonight, God will do that if you just open up and let him kiss you tonight. But there are angels in this place. But an angel of the Lord comes to Cornelius, and he said, Cornelius, you are known in heaven for two things. The Lord constantly remembers your prayers and your gifts. And later on in that chapter, he had the same testimony. Cornelius says that, that an angel of the Lord came to me and said that, I, I'm, I, that the Lord remembers my prayers and my gifts. And I just want to encourage you, mom, dad, you have a lost, lost son, a wayward daughter, remember the Lord remembers your prayers. Don't give up praying, but he also remembers your gifts. And, and I want to encourage you tonight. Listen, the Lord, the Lord has brought this revival here, and I thank God for it. Don't you thank God for this revival? And he's going to supply, amen, he's going to supply, and he's going to meet the needs of this revival, uh, that it can continue to go on. We have complete confidence in that. But he uses God's people. And I just want to encourage you to invest and give tonight. You know, the Scripture says that wherever you, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. 
not only here in, he in earth, but I believe also in heaven, because your gifts are remembered there before the Lord. I believe he watches over every time that you give to someone in need or given to invest in the kingdom of God. And I'll give you that opportunity to do that. Our ushers are coming forward. I ask that you would just uh, give unto the Lord as an expression of your love and appreciation, knowing that heaven is counting on you tonight, and, he, and, and heaven's watching, and he'll bless you tonight. He'll bless you as you give. Father, we do thank you for what you're doing here. And Lord, I ask that you would speak to each one of us. Speak to us, Lord, as to what you would have for us to give, that the needs of this wonderful revival would be met. Father, I ask that you would look down upon your people. Lord, that you would see us tonight giving cheerfully and lovingly unto you of expressions of devotion and hearts of love. And Father, I pray that you would bless your people tonight. Lord, I pray I speak a blessing over those, Lord, that give in obedience to you. Father, may you open the windows of heaven. and May you pour out a blessing and a healing, a refreshing upon their lives, Father. Lord, we'll give you the thanks and the praise. Receive now, Lord, these gifts of love as an expression of our appreciation and devotion unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed be the Lord, Lord God Almighty. Worthy is His name. He is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is His name. We will follow You, Lord. follow you, Lord. We will walk after you with all our heart, with all our soul and mind, O oh Lord. Lay aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset, to run the race with patience that is set before us. I receive the prize He has fire in his eyes A sword in his hand He's riding a white horse Across this land He has fire in his eyes A sword in his hand He's riding a white horse all across this land It's calling out to you and me Will you ride me? When the Lord says to you Will you follow him? When he says move forward Will you hold back? Or will you give him everything you have? And say Lord I will follow you I will follow you, Lord, with all my heart and my soul and mind. We say yes, Lord. We'll ride with you. He has a crown on his head. He carries a scepter in his hand. He's leading the armies all across this land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes, Lord. Yes, yes Lord. Lord. We'll ride. Say yes, Lord. We'll stand, stand up and fight. We will ride. We'll ride with the armies of heaven. We'll be dressed in white. We'll be dressed in white. We say yes, Lord.
a fire in his eyes and it's his love for his bride he's longing that we be with him right by his side that fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side he's calling out to you right now Will you ride with me? Or do you love the world you've come to know more than you love him? Will you ride with him? We say yes, Lord. Well, lift up your hands. Say it with me. Yes. We say yes, yes Lord. Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'd like for everyone to remain standing. If you would, if you're sitting down and you can stand, please stand up. Pastors, I'd like to um, warn you of something that, that we have um, been, we've been, this has characterized pastors for years, and that is uh, the control factor. Uh, you're, when revival breaks out in your church, you should pastor the revival, but don't control the revival. You're not called to control it. And um, many of that have come to these meetings, you know, when you have, we've had 600,000, they come from all over the place. We've seen it, friend, go on in this building. And you'll see us sometimes taking care of a situation. For example, when I begin to preach, if someone is laughing, if someone is, is having a time in the Lord somewhere, we'll move them out of the building. And that's because I, I'm not, I, I, it's not because I, I'm not excited about what's going on in your life. It's just that there's got to be time for the Word of God to be preached with no distractions. And that is the way this revival has maintained itself since Father's Day. That's not speaking against anybody that practices any other method, friend. Don't you, don't you quote me. Misquote me. I'm saying that's how this revival has been used of the Lord because there's a segment of time, it's called the preaching of the Word of God, where hundreds and hundreds of people who don't know the Lord hear about him. There's people here tonight that have not understood anything yet. They have not understood anything. Maybe the only thing they understood about, was about these struggles, these marriages we're going through. They understood that because that's where they're at. But the rest of it, they can't praise, they can't worship, they can't sing, they don't understand the dancing, they don't understand the prophetic word that came a few minutes ago about the pool of Bethesda. They don't understand that because they're not there, friend. This is their first time in an evangelical church. And so they're in this building tonight. And if you're here, and this is all strange and odd to you, I welcome you. I welcome you to the, the, this, this revival. This is a true outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I, I go back to what we were saying before, pastors. Don't try to control everything that's going on, okay? And if there's, I'd rather deal with a little fleshly zeal than carnal resistance. That's been said so much. And if there's, you know, if there's kids overreacting sometime, we've, you know, we usually let it run its course. We do, man, because rather than, than quench a child that is trying to experience the things of God, 
We, we watch young people go on to maturity. We've watched them over the last several months, and I've seen some of them come in here, shake under the power, have an experience with God, and come for weeks and just want the same experience, and, and God blesses them and blesses them. Another One of those young, young men that was doing that is now interceding every night in the prayer meeting. He's back there right now praying for your soul. He's moved from that into that. But what would have happened if we'd come up when he was down here shaking every night under the power and we'd come up and said, listen now, it's not going to be the same every night. God's not. We'd have just quenched that spirit that was in that desire to go after God. And now he's moved from that into intercessory prayer. You know what I'm saying, friend? So um, don't try to control it. And just keep a watch over what's going on, Pastor. But don't try to control it. Don't try to control it. Uh, remain standing. Everything, they're going to be fine over here, Marty. You don't have to worry about a thing. Um, I appreciate the ushers in this room. Just a tremendous job. And this revival is being monitored all the time. There's people all over this building that are watch, watching what's going on. We also have police here. Okay, there are police that um, you don't know they're police, but they're police. We have SWAT members, members that are trained in special tactics. For, and just in case some crazy comes running in here. All right? And we've had some crazies running in this place, friend. <laughs> I, had a, I had a cop come up to me and go, Steve, let me tell you something. I love you, brother, but this is a time bomb, man. Something's going to happen in this place. And, and you can be spiritual, friend, and say, well, God will protect us. We need to show a little sense, too, friend. If somebody comes walking in the door with a, with a, you know, a, a machine gun, I ain't going to be up here praying and say, God, just watch over me, Lord. <laughs> I want to say, Marty, Tony, stop him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Before, is that all right, Pastor? I don't know. You're more spiritual than I am. I got a family. I got kids. They want to see Daddy at the end of the night. So anyway, we have folks that are watching over the revival, and that has been wisdom. But someone gave me this book the other day, and don't, don't sit down. You're going to sit down for a few minutes in just, just a minute. But... um. Uh, I've got a lot of, uh, several thousand books in my library, just old books, and um, if you got one lying around, I'll take it. Uh, but uh, old Christian books, and just a lot of books on revival that are two and three hundred years old that I don't travel with. And um, this, is, this is not an old book, but it's from the 30s. And, um, and this is, uh, was a, um, I, an edition put out by Zondervan all about Charles Finney. I've got a lot of Finney's works, but I never read this out of his journals. And it says, when, it says, when the majority of the uh, governor people had been converted, Finney went to DeKalb. He traveled around the U.S. holding great revival, 16 miles farther north, where the Methodists, listen to this, friends, where the Methodists sometimes before had a revival in which many people fell under divine power. The Presbyterian neighbors, this is hilarious, the Presbyterian neighbors made light of this, and, and bad blood existed henceforth between the two groups. Because of many Methodists here tonight, Hallelujah. Well, bless your little shaking hearts, man. Here you had all these problems going on. And, and uh, Finney says this, I had not preached long, says this is out of his journal, says Finney of this revival. Before one evening, just at the close of my sermon, I observed a man fall from his seat near the door. Boom. It doesn't say boom, but I'm adding that. From what I saw, I was satisfied that it was a case of falling under the power of God. Now, you can call it anything you want, friend. You can call it slain in the spirit. Some folks don't like that because people that are slain in the Bible are dead. And so slain in the spirit, you call it resting in the Lord. You can call it laying down on the ground in the church. It doesn't matter what you call it. Take it or leave it, friend. It doesn't matter to me. It's, don't major on minors. It's a minor thing. It's wonderful, but it's not what we're all after. We're after Jesus' experience. From what I saw, I was satisfied that it was a case of falling under the power of God as the Methodist would express it, and I supposed it was a Methodist. But on inquiry, I learned that it was one of the principal members of the Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Hallelujah. The remarkable thing was that during this revival, there were several cases of the Presbyterians falling under the power, but none of the Methodists. This, of course, healed the wound. I love God. This healed the wound between the two groups and knit them together into a fighting unit for God's battle under Finney's leadership. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see how God takes care of business, friends. 
I can just see him go, well, there's a rift between the Presbyterians and the Methodists. Let's see, I'm going to just knock down a three of the Presbyterians tonight. Just heal this thing. Pastor Finney won't even have to deal with it. I love it, man. I love God. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives right now. Everyone together pray this prayer with me. At home, you pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Now, there's some of you that are in your late 60s, 70s, and 80s. You don't think God can change you. You better pray this prayer right now. If you're breathing, you need changing. If you don't need changing, friend, if you're so much like God, I want you to come touch me. I want, man, I want what you have. But I don't, I got a feeling you need more of the Lord. I want everyone to pray this prayer. Pastors, pray this. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. We got some good friends from, um, that live in Santiago, Chile with us, Don and Melba. Excellent. Are y'all going back there? Come on up here, both of you. Come on, Melba. The wives, this is reluctant wife night. <laughs> but Don, you shared something. Uh, Don and Melba are in charge of church planning projects and the teen challenge projects. For example, Rodney Hart, who's down in, uh, in Asuncion, Paraguay, uh, planning that teen challenge center there inside the prison that we talked about last night. Don Wilkerson's here with us tonight, and he talked about that. Well, Don sort of oversees those projects all over South America, and you shared something yesterday about a young girl in Chile. Santiago, share that with us. How many know God is moving around the world? Listen to this. This is the kind of stuff that's fixing to happen in this area. Uh, we, in our church in Santiago, Chile, that we meet every Sunday in the Holiday Inn Crown Plaza, a 14-year-old girl was at high school one day getting ready to take a test. There was only one other Christian girl in the school, and so they got together in the corner of the classroom and did what all good students do. They prayed. Ten-second prayer, Dear Lord Jesus, help us with this test. By the time they finished that ten-second prayer, every teenager in that classroom was crying Every teenager in the classroom on the floor above them was crying. This little 14-year-old girl just looks at the teacher and says, this is the power of God. And when she said that, all the kids fell out of their desk onto the floor. Yeah. This is the power of God. Yes, 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 Hallelujah. yes, yes, yes. And the glory invades the secular. And the school called in the psychiatrist to try to understand this case of mass hysteria, but the kids came to church and gave their heart and life to Jesus Christ. God bless you, brother. Did y'all hear that? The psychiatrist came in just trying to explain this mass hysteria. You watch what's going to happen in our schools, man. Just watch. Now, here's what's going to take place. We have a month or so left of school. How many kids will say Hallelujah. And then summer. Well, let me tell you what's going to happen during the summer. There's a lot of young people going to be saved this upcoming month. And summertime, we're going to see thousands of students saved. Don't miss the revival during the summertime, friend. Last summer wore us to a frenzy. I would get home as the sun was coming up. I said, God, this ain't going to work, man. <laughs> night after night after night. And, and so I was so thankful when school came around so we had an excuse to taper it back a little bit. You know, that was our spiritual excuse. You know, we're going to school start. We've got to study, kids. So let's cut back to 2 o'clock in the morning. But you're going to see, as souls are saved this upcoming month and then this summer, thousands are saved. We're still in 1996. This is a year of the favor of the Lord. Watch what takes place when school cranks back up at the end of summer. <laughs> Remember these words, friend. Watch what happens. We got great things in store over the next several months, but you watch what's going to take place. Don, man, I love that. Taking us by surprise. Hallelujah. We got Greg and Becky Priest with us tonight. God bless you. Y'all stand. They're Teen Challenge directors here in Pensacola. Give them a hand. Turn around. If you have a problem about anything, talk to them. Don't talk to me. Talk to them. And if they can't help you, turn and talk to Don Wilkerson. He's the answer man. He can help you right here. Have you all met? 
Okay, good. Hallelujah. Well, I want to tell you what happened today to me and then um, preach for a few minutes. This is, um, this is hard to do, but um, I took a few minutes this afternoon to, um, to rest. I was up at 6 o'clock this morning working on tonight's message and went out, did some, ran some errands and came back and took about an hour of rest and I was awakened by um, an incredibly vivid dream. And this is the dream in brief. And friends, I don't have dreams like this. I, you can ask my wife, I go to sleep and I wake up. I mean, if I have dreams, I don't remember them. I sleep. All through the night, I can go to sleep in two minutes and get up without an alarm clock. Have been able to for years and years. Regardless of when I go to sleep, I can still get up at the same time, 5 o'clock or 5.30 every morning. Even when I go to sleep at 2, it's just built in me. I can get up automatically. And so I don't ever get up with dreams. I've only had this happen to me a few times in my life. But uh, this dream woke me up. And this is what happened. Pastor, you were involved in this. We were at the revival. We're praying for people. There was a mighty move of God going on at the altars. And out of the corner of my eye, I was praying with someone over here. Out of the corner of my eye, pastor was praying with a man, and there was a figure of a small child next to the man. I want everyone to listen. Those of you at home, you listen. Listen to this because it may pertain to you. There was a figure of a man and there was a small child next to that man. The small child was not moving, and the man was bent over, just going up and down on his knees like this. The pastor was praying for him. As soon as I focused in on the two figures that he was praying for, the man and the child, this happened early afternoon today, I became violently ill. I began to convulse and heave with incredible violence. Pastor, you rushed over to me and you knew that I was very, very, very sick and you brought a handkerchief and you covered my mouth and I began to well up inside of me, friend. I started to, to I'm going to go ahead and share with you what happened. I began to throw up from deep, deep inside of me and it just kept coming and coming and Pastor was praying over me, trying to help me. And I kept throwing up, and he was interceding for me, praying for me. He knew something was going on in the spirit realm, that I was not physically sick. It was a spirit message. God was speaking. He was doing something, and he kept trying to help me, kept wiping my mouth, and I kept getting sicker and sicker. The more I looked at that man, the sicker I got. Now, sir, you're probably in this room tonight. If you're not, you're at home listening to this. I turned my head from the man, and when I turned my head from the man, it was like turning a page in a book. I was gone. The whole scene was over, and I was in an office, and there was a secretary talking on the phone. She was speaking to an excavating company, and she was calling to get the steam shovels, and the bulldozers out to a field to find the body of that little girl. And I'm here to tell you tonight, there is somebody within the sound of my voice, you have been responsible for a murder, you have killed someone in the past, you have murdered a child and buried that body, no one knows about it, you got away with it, and I'm telling you tonight, you have not gotten away with it. You have been caught by God Almighty. You have been caught. Now you may be listening to me and you know exactly what I'm talking about because you're the man, but it may be that your brother committed the crime 
And he told you about it 18 years ago or 25 years ago. He told you about it and it was so scary to you. You have hidden all these years from it, but you are just as guilty of that child's murder as he is. I'm telling you tonight, get right with God. You cannot carry that any longer. Sir, if you're watching from your home and that is you, I plead by the mercies of God, confess your crime. You will stand on judgment day for that child's death. Now, you folks know me. I would never do anything like this if I didn't know it was God, and that was God just sin. If you're in this church tonight and you've been part of a murder, I've already had one man confess a murder to me in this revival. I've also had others come in here that were about to kill a person, and they came in here right before they killed him with the weapon. We've had it happen. Friends, we've been here a while, friends. We've seen some stuff. But if you're in this place tonight, you get right with God and turn yourself in. Turn yourself in. It would be better for you, and I don't know what the authority is going to say, but it would be better for you to be in jail for the next 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 years and be right with God than to be out there in the world roaming the streets and one day face the almighty God who will judge you, friend, like no judge on earth could judge you. Get right with the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, bow your heads, would you? Just everyone bow their heads. I want everyone to pray this prayer. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. Amen. I'm going to continue for the next few minutes, friends, on the arrows of the Lord. I've shared in this congregation that God has a bow and he's got a quiver full of arrows. And this is so in, in, impressed upon my heart. Pastor has been preaching a series here at this church entitled A Dichotomy of a Satanic Attack. And I want to tell you, Pastor, you could preach that for a year. And the reason we've had breakthroughs and you haven't been able to preach is because you're speaking on the dichotomy of a satanic attack. And the very breakthrough that came was all part of God's victory. That's, you know, and so, but it's a series on the dichotomy of a satanic attack. How, how many know that the church is being attacked? How many, have a, how many have had a great time in this revival, went out and all hell broke loose? Almost everybody in here, you've experienced that. I have too. You think the evangelists live some type of superficial life? You're wrong, sis. We get hit from all sides. In a major way. But the arrows of the Lord... I'm going to go ahead tonight and use an illustration. Charlie, can you help me on this? I told you I ran some errands today. Well, I went out and got some arrows. And I rarely use illustrations in these revivals because I, a lot of times, pastors, your illustrations take away from the Word of God. But tonight, the simplicity of what the Bible says about the arrows of the Lord, this will fit perfectly. The arrows of the Lord. Those of you that are going to be turning to scriptures tonight, I'm going to give you the scriptures, but we're not going to be parking on any one scripture. I'm going to be sharing many of them with you, so the best thing for you to do is write them down and look at them in just a little while. But some of you, look at this way, some of you are under such heavy conviction I'm going to be reading just for a few minutes out of the book of Psalms where David was under the conviction of the Lord. As a matter of fact, I want you to turn with me to Psalms chapter 38. Psalms 
Some of you are under incredible conviction. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about how to handle that conviction, what to do with that conviction. The conviction, you need to first of all thank God that you're under conviction. Thank the Lord you're under conviction, man. That means he's with you. That means the Lord is dealing with you. What you need to be afraid of if you, is you, you don't feel the Lord. You don't feel his presence. If you feel Jesus tugging at your heart tonight, thank the Lord. You're under conviction. But how do you deal with that? How do you deal it when, when, the, when the arrows of the Lord pierce your heart? And they're going to pierce your heart tonight, friend. Those of you that need Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, God's going to pierce your heart. Look at Psalm 38 with me tonight. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, and chasten me not in thy burning anger, for thine arrows have sunk deep into me, and there, thy hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thy indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin, for my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden they weighed too much for me, my wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long, for my loins are filled with burning, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am benumbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. Friend, I want to tell you something. That's a sign. That right there is a psalm of a man under conviction. Turn with me to Psalm 32. How many know the story of David and Bathsheba? Here's a perfect example, friends, of God trying to get a hold of you. This young couple over here that shared about their marriage being healed. I want you all to stand again right now. Just stand up. Where you at? Both of you. Sister, what's your name? Constance, let me tell you something, Constance. When you shared what you shared, you were in an adulterous situation, weren't you? That's a, th you, were a, you were a sinner. Boy, that's a first step towards home right there. <laughs> that's, you look at the prodigal, that's the first thing that he came to. He said, I've sinned, man. You were a sinner. And it, you had to get to the point, sister, you ought to come up here and preach tonight. You had to get to the point where you hated your sin. I want to tell you what happened to you. The arrows of the Lord went after you, sister. I mean, he followed you everywhere you went. I'm telling you tonight, God's got a bow and arrow, and he's a perfect aim. He knows where you're at. Look at Psalm 32. We're going to read a little. Some of you, thank you. God bless you. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is a man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. Look my way, church. There's many people in this room tonight. The hand of the Lord is heavy on you. You are buckled over in your spirit. You may be standing strong. You may look like everything's okay, but you feel the conviction of the Holy Ghost on you. You know you're not living for God. You know you're away from the Lord, and the hand of the Lord is on you. You need to thank the Lord for that. I love the writings of David. Everyone here esteems him as a great man. I want to tell you, he was a murderer. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the heat, fever, heat of summer. I acknowledge my sin to thee. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. How many have had their sins forgiven in this place? Let me tell you about the arrows of the Lord, friend. Now, please don't touch these tonight because these things are sharp. They're extremely sharp. The Bible says in Psalm 45, 5, his arrows are sharp. You can look it up later, friends. His arrows are sharp. It says, thine arrows are sharp. 
the peoples fall under thee. These arrows that I brought with me tonight, friends, look this way. These were crafted by a man named Ted Nugent. Some of you know the rock singer Ted Nugent. Maybe you remember Ted Nugent and the Amboy Dukes, and now he's traveling just as Ted Nugent. It's the same one. He makes arrows, sharp arrows. He's a master bow hunter. He owns his own company, and he gathers bow hunters together from all over the countryside, and they hunt together. They have a big union. But this is one of his arrows. These are called Nugent blades. These are two-bladed, razor-sharp, 125 grain killer points. I want to tell you something. When I looked at this thing, I want to, if you, you can draw blood just by touching the tip of this, friend. I said, God, that is a sharp arrow. That's incredible, but Lord, there ain't nothing like your arrow. This is sharp. Ted Nugent gave us the best he had. But I mean, God's arrows dwarf this little thing. They don't come close. You want to know why? The Word, God's Word, His arrows is living and active and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. His arrows, His arrows tonight, friend, will pierce as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. His arrows go in and around and through. They go everywhere, friend. His arrows are sharp. There is no creature, the Bible says, hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of God with whom we have to do. Those of you that are under conviction tonight, God loves you, has a plan for your life, but he ain't going to put up with your stinking all day long. Friend, the Bible says there's coming a day where his spirit will no longer contend with you. Read it in the book of Genesis. He said, my spirit will not always contend with man. That contend means wrestle. He's not always going to do this tug and war with you. One day, you're going to get up to tug with God, and the room's going to be empty. He left you, friend. He's gone. He's over with you. The Bible says he will not always contend with you. While the arrow is flying into your heart tonight, move, friend. Be like David. David felt the arrows of the Lord. That brings me to the second point tonight. His arrows. Stick fast. Psalm 38, 2. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, and chasten me not in thy burning anger, for thine arrows have sunk deep into me. The King James says, thine arrows stick fast in me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. We read it. Friend, look this way. Some of you tonight, Tony, I want you to help me. Get up here, brother. Some of you left out of here last night. This is what you, you left out of here like this. Put that one in my back. That's how you walked out of this building last night. All right? We had 200 people didn't respond to the altar call last night. I know this congregation. I know you, man. I can stick one of these things in you right now. I know you're sitting. I know where you're sitting. And God speaks to your heart. His arrows stick fast. They go in, friend. And I want to tell you, you can tug and tug and tug all day long. They ain't coming out. He's got you. Am I telling the truth, Constance? He's got you, doesn't he, sister? You went to Birmingham like this. You walked around. And I, you know what I get a kick out of? I see this all the time. Stick that thing in my back. Easy. Easy. If he pokes me, I'm going to poke him. <laughs> but some of you walk out of this place and we come up to you and you go, how you doing? And you go, fine. <laughs> Richard, am I telling the truth, brother? Fine. Is anything wrong? No. That's how crystal clear it is to me, friends. I see them things sticking out all over. And you go, everything's fine with me. Or this is what some of you do. Keep that arrow back there. 
Take that, Charity. Pull the point off that thing, Tony. Just <laughs> unscrew it. This is what you do. You leave out of the revival, the arrow's poked in you. Okay, like this. You know what you do? Here's the religious folks here. They put their choir robe over it. <laughs> Not me, man. God's not dealing with my heart. Let me have that other point. Put it sticking in my back. You got these little points sticking out all over the place. I'm just fine. You cover them up, friends. You snap it. Give me one of those posts. You snap that thing. Just You walk out of the revival. You go over to Shoney's. You're sitting down. And, and somebody brings up the revival. Friend, I want to tell you, they may not see this shaft, but it's all over you, man. David, it was all over David. Talk to Nathan when you get to heaven. Nathan's the one that, con uh, that confronted David. When Nathan has put the points back on, someone's going to get hurt here. You don't know how sharp these are. You can shave with these arrows. Ted Nugent is a dangerous man. And I want to tell you something, Ted. I'm sending you this tape because I love you. I really do. And Ted, I listened to your music all through the 60s. I was a major fan of yours, and some of my friends and I made you rich. But I want to tell you something, Ted. These arrows are sharp. These are sharp. But the Word of God is sharper. And I want you to understand something. I understand you're a master bow hunter. But there's someone after you. <laughs> there's someone after you that dwarfs all your skills. You can't come close to his skills. It's called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is after you, Ted. Now, I'm telling you something right now from the Spirit. There have been people talking to you about God, and you've been trying to run from it. Just like when you'd, you'd kill a doe, or you, you, you'll kill an animal, and they'll run off, and you have to track it. Sometimes you'll actually tie a string to these arrows to follow that animal. I want to tell you, God's got this arrow. He's already pierced your heart. He's piercing it again, and he's following you, brother. He wants your life. I'm telling you this out of love, Ted. I love you. I care about you. There's a mighty revival going on in Pensacola, Florida. I know you're a busy man. I know you're still a rock and roller, but I want you to come to this revival. You won't be condemned. You'll be loved. You come to this revival, we'll love on you, man. We care about you. 600,000 people have been here. 600,000 from all over the nation. I want you to come and receive the love of Jesus Christ. This isn't religion. This isn't religion. This is true Christianity, man. We're finding God. And I, I want to tell you something else. You're running through some problems in your home. There's some struggles going on right now. You ain't going to find the answer with all your friends. You ain't going to find the answer in music. The, the answer is in Jesus Christ. I want you to come, Ted. I want you to come to this revival. can't get away from him, friend. Whew. Those of you in this room under conviction, God's brought you here tonight. There ain't nothing you can do to shake his arrows loose from you. Let me tell you, I'm going to share one more point about arrows. Talk to you a couple seconds about the conviction of the Holy Ghost, what you can do about it, then you're going to respond tonight. You're going to respond. But the arrows of the Lord have pierced your soul. Some of you have had arrows sticking out of you for 18 years. You've done everything you can. The prophet Nathan, you read about this in the book of Psalms. No, what, what book is that in? Samuel. Prophet Nathan came up to David, told him a little story about a man who wanted a feast, had all kinds of animals, but he went and took the one little lamb that this one man had, one little animal that this other man had to go have his feast with. And David said, that man ought to be crucified. That man ought to be killed. This is a Steve Hill version. That, thing ought, that man ought to be killed. And Nathan said, you're the man. Samuel took an arrow from the Lord, and he went shoop, right into his heart. But Samuel also knew David already had several sticking out of him. 
That was a killing arrow. That was the one that sunk the bear right there. That's the one that killed him right there. Dear God, I've sinned. The last point about arrows tonight, the arrows of the Lord go forth like lightning. Zechariah 9, 14 says, Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. Habakkuk 3, 11, I believe it is, says, The sun and the moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of thine arrows. Now, I'm not pulling this out of context, friends. The Bible says that his arrows go forth like lightning. If I had everyone give me an adjective about lightning, most people would say quick, bright, frightening. Those are the kind of things we've seen it in the skies. We've seen horizontal lightning. How many have seen horizontal lightning? Vertical lightning. I've seen it in the skies since the last couple of weeks here in Florida. We get storms down here, man. And I watch them. I'm amazed at them. But the other day, I was watching lightning out of the back porch of my home. And I was watching it shoot. And the thing, they say it goes from the ground up, but it shot. It did curves. The lightning did curves. How many have seen that? And I saw that and went, dear God, look at your arrows. It was going like this. Go anywhere you want to, friend. His arrows will follow you. They'll follow you back home tonight. They'll follow you over to Shoney's. His arrow will follow you everywhere you go. They'll follow you into school, sir. Little girl, they'll follow you right into math class. His arrows will follow you everywhere. You've been hit. They go forth like lightning. And also, lightning. If they're typifying God's arrows, if lightning is, lightning is 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is only 10. Lightning is five times hotter than the sun. That's why it burns when he hits you. When his arrows hit you, that's why David felt what he felt inside. He was burning within. His bones gave way. His joints gave way. His heart was melting before him. Why? It was burning inside, friend. The light, the power of lightning of these arrows, friends, it'll expose everything inside of you, friend. The sun and the moon are dwarfed at God's arrows. The light the lightning of God's arrows. I enjoy this. I don't know if you are. But sure makes sense to me. I remember when I was hit. Matter of fact, I walked around about five years with arrows stuck all over me. How about you, Tony? I did, man. People talked to me about God. You know, I remember one time I even cried. And I went on for three more years like this. Smoking dope, you know, drinking, cussing, doing pills, and I don't believe in God. What's that thing sticking out of your ribs, man? <laughs> I don't believe in the Lord. Walking around like this, man. Some of you are like that. I can see them tonight. I can see the arrows sticking all over this place. Some of you walked out of here last night, and this is what you said. You said, uh, that's pretty good. That's all right. Or did, did it, you know, did it, did it, did it touch you or anything? No. Nah. <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> That's how silly you look, friend. Yeah. You're under conviction, man. God's dealing with your heart. And you try to fake it, man. I look at this man right here. You are a master at this. Robert, here's Robert, the banker from North Georgia. Y'all read the story in News Journal? Brother, this is a classic arrow story. I'm sorry, I gotta use it. You come home, your wife's got the Allison video on. You come in there, you watch that, that Allison video is on. If you haven't read, seen that Allison video, get it, man, and watch it at least five times a day. Okay? I have one pastor who watches it for devotions every morning. That's what he, and then he reads the Bible after the video. You were watching that, she was watching that video. You walked in the room, and out of that TV set, shoot, shoot. And you're so macho, man. You went. You know, like, 
this is good. Listen, I gotta go to the bathroom in just a minute. <laughs> and you trotted out of that room, man, like, ain't nothing gonna touch me, man. You know, I'm all right. Then you went into your bedroom, shut the door, and you go, oh! <laughs> oh, I've been hit! Is that the truth? It is the truth. He's confessing tonight. I've been hit. Yes! The guy was hit by the power of God and cried his eyes out. The arrows of the Lord, friend, they'll hit you, they'll follow you, and you can't shake them loose until you repent. You've got to repent. You've got to repent. You've got to repent. The only one that can remove that arrow from you is the Holy Ghost. He's the only one that can pull that out of your heart, man. Try it any other way. Go bow down to Buddha all night long. You'll walk out of there with the shaft sticking out. Do whatever you want to do. Give the preacher $100,000 tonight. Tell him you love the revival. Walk out of here. You'll be sticking out like this. That won't do it, friend. Repent. Repent. You read the Psalms of David. He repented, man. He repented. Those arrows just fell out, man. He walked around a free man after adultery and murder. He repented. He changed. He turned around the arrows of the Lord, friend. What are you going to do about him tonight? What are you going to do? Well, hallelujah. Charity, you're going to sing in just a minute. God's arrows. Boy. And it's something, pastors, how we've got to make sure we set everything on our notes. You ever done that? Well, I'm going to make sure it's, I said everything, you know. <laughs> Don't fall into that trap either, because half of it's a bunch of junk. It is. Some that will have 18 pages, 18 pages and maybe five of it is worth saying. It's good to have the 18, but don't, don't dwell on it. Sometimes you, you go too long, man. I mean, right now there's people bleeding all over this place. They're bleeding all over this place. They got arrows stuck all over them. The Holy Ghost wants to perform surgery. He was going to come down here. He wants to remove those arrows from you. I said the conviction of the Holy Spirit is a sign of his presence. I've also said that it's impossible to remove this conviction from your life. It's impossible to remove the arrow from your life. You can try to cover it up. You can try to drown it. That's what folks do too, don't they, Tony? You know, just, they'll go into the bar tonight and go, give me Bloody Mary. <laughs> I still feel it, another, a double. That's are doing it all over this city tonight. All over this city. They try, to drown around the, they try to drown out the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And finally, they just sort of pass out, you know. But they'll, eventually, what they'll do is they'll, they'll get a little loose, you know, they'll start talking to the bartender about God, you know. I went to the Brownsville Revival. <laughs> Brother Steve preached on the arrows of the Lord. But I wouldn't listen to him. I didn't hear him. It didn't affect me. <laughs> but it affected a lot of other people. <laughs> I love you, friend, but I want to tell you, you better get right with the Lord tonight. I'm closing with this. Every single one of us in this room will respond tonight to the Holy Spirit. Every one of us will respond. I'm saying that again. Everyone will respond. One way or the other, you're going to respond tonight. But let me tell you something about guilt. If you're guilty, you're guilty. How many have ever told a lie? How many have ever told a lie? How many remember what it felt like with that lie? Let me ask you again. How many have ever told a lie? You remember, you remember what it was like? You walked around like this. You remember? As soon as you saw your mama, because you, she's the one you lied to, you know? 
How many know what I'm talking about? What happens when you confess? What happens when you come up and say, Daddy, this is what I did. That's what happens. That's what happens when you confess. That's what happens tonight, friend. You come up here, those of you that are burdened, you're away from God, there's sin in your life, God wants to heal you, He wants to forgive you, but you've got to step out. You've got to come down to the master surgeon. You've got to let Him remove those arrows. He's pierced your heart. When I say things like God loves you and has a plan for your life, that's an arrow that's piercing many of you tonight. When I say things like Jesus Christ wants to be the Lord of your life, He wants to govern your life, many of you know that He is not governing your life. He is not controlling your life. And an arrow has pierced your heart that'll never leave you friend until you get that thing right it'll follow you if you're guilty you're guilty friend you got to get it right tonight some of you I've said tonight I uh, talk a lot about religious people some of you are great church members but you don't know God this arrow is fixing to pierce your heart you're gonna feel this right now you go to church you're faithful you look good you smell good you walk right everything about you is just nice 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 but you don't know the Lord you don't know God. I want to tell you, friend, the arrow of the Lord just pierced you. Just pierced you. What are you going to do about it? You don't know God. You don't know the Lord. You don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know all about Him. America knows all about Him. Most Americans that don't know God could still give the plan of salvation. They know all about Him. They've heard about Him all day long. Everywhere you go, they've heard about Him. But they don't know Him. 93% of our households have a Bible in their home. 85% of Americans believe Jesus Christ was the Son of God, but they don't know Him. I'm asking you, friend, do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? All during the day is Jesus Christ your focus in life. If He's not, if you don't live like that, the arrows of the Lord have just pierced you, friend. When you believe in the Lord... Whoever believeth in him, that word believe means to adhere to like glue. That means you just don't accept him as a hip pocket Jesus or someone you're going to hang from your dashboard. You receive him as your Savior. You embrace him as your Lord. And from that moment on, he controls your every step. If you don't know him like that, when I give this altar call, you run down here. Get right with God tonight. Get right with the Lord. Those of you that are backslid, I'm going to tell you what bow hunters will do. I know we probably do have some bow hunters here tonight. They had little rings that you could tie on the front of these arrows and tie a string to them. You could shoot the game and then follow the arrow. God's got strings attached to his too. He's going to hit you and he's going to pull you right up here to these altars. He's going to wind you in, friend, tonight. This is where it's going to happen, right down here. God doesn't want to hurt you, friend. He wants to heal you. He doesn't want to hurt you, he wants to heal you. He wants to make you better. He wants to fix you, but he's like a surgeon. He's got to take care of the, infest, the, the infection first. He's got to take care of the root problem. It's called sin. And when this arrow hits you, that's just like a surgeon come up to you and poking you and going, where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? Where does it hurt? Ow! Come in my office on Monday. We'll deal with that. Ow! Now, come on down here. Let's deal with this. Does this make sense to anybody but me? I don't know. I don't know how to make it any simpler, friends. This is a conviction of the Holy Ghost. David felt it. I'm going to sit across him, the table one day at the marriage supper of the Lamb with David. I'm going to look at him. He's going to look at me, and he's going to go, the arrows of the Lord. Man, that's sharp, man. You use my story, man. You use my story, Steve. And I looked, I'm going to look at him and go, man, you repented, David. You set an example for the world. I love you, David. You repented, man. And you wrote about your anguish, and we read it, and you brought comfort to millions and millions of people after you went on. Thank you, David. Right now, I want everyone to stand in this room. We're going to give an altar call. Don't anyone walk out those doors unless it's an emergency. And I want to tell you, you go to the bathroom, you go with arrows sticking out of you. <laughs> a 
Last night I preached on who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who do others say that you are? And who you really are? There's only two classifications of people, regardless of what anybody says. There's no such thing as lawyers and doctors and butchers and bakers and candlestick makers. There's no such thing as all these little categories of people. Forget it, friend. That's man. God and the devil see two people, those who know the Lord and those who don't, those who are washed in the blood of the Lamb and those who aren't, those who have received Jesus as their Savior and those who haven't. I want to tell you something else. Those who are white hot for the Lord and those who are cold. Those of you that are lukewarm in this place, he will spit you out of his mouth. So that ain't a category, friend, you want to be in. And cold ain't either. I'm a Christian, but I'm just not that committed. He's going to spit you out of his mouth for that. You need to get down here at this altar and get right with God tonight. If you're here in this place and you don't know the Lord, I've said, he loves you has a plan for your life, friend, and he brought you here tonight to get things right with him. Jesus Christ, we sang about it tonight, wants to be your very best friend. You don't know what kind of problems I'm having right now, Steve. Exactly. I don't, but he does. He's spoken to your heart. No one can fix it like Jesus. No one can take care of those situations like Jesus, but you've got to step out. You've got to step out. Now, friend, You've been hit by these. You've been hit tonight by these. In the balcony, look at me, young people. You need Jesus Christ to forgive you. Don't anyone hesitate. As soon as Charity begins singing this, you at home, you've been hit by the arrows of the Lord. I can see you on your couch. They're sticking out of your body, man. Some of you had them sticking out for years. Get right with God tonight. Remove those arrows. Aren't they a little uncomfortable? Get right with the Lord. Repent. That means... Turn around. Ask him to forgive you and turn around tonight as we pray together as this congregation prays and believes God. Those of you that are away from the Lord, come and repent tonight. The arrows of the Lord will be removed from you. Those of you that are backslid, you're big time backslid, come back to Jesus. Those of you that have never known the Lord, come, back to, come to the Lord tonight. Those of you that are unsure of your salvation, this is an arrow right here that just pierced some people. If I had everyone close their eyes. Matter of fact, close your eyes, everybody in this room. If you would die tonight, are you certain, without a shadow of a doubt, that you would go to heaven? If you aren't absolutely positive, then the arrows of the Lord have just hit you. Open your eyes. When this altar call is given, you need to seal it and make sure you're going to heaven, friend. This is for everyone in this room that needs Jesus Christ to wash their sins away. I'm going to tell you something we don't do here. We don't rededicate our lives to God in this place. I'm sick and tired of rededications. Pastors in your church, they rededicate dedicate their lives every week. I just rededicate my life. I'm rededicating. Why? Because, well, I'm going to sin this week. You know, I sinned last week. going to sin this week. But I know I can rededicate my life next Sunday. No, friend. Forget it. You're a sinner. Constance, God bless you for what you said and the way you said it. You said, I was a sinner. You didn't say... I came back to my husband and rededicated my life to God. No, I was a sinner. And if you had been caught in the midst of that, in a car accident, was killed, you would have gone to hell, am I telling the truth? Sinner. You need forgiveness tonight, friend. But I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist, I'm Episcopalian. We haven't talked about that tonight, friend, because that don't count. That doesn't count. This is not an Assembly of God altar call. This is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ altar call. You come. Everyone in this room, everyone in this room, you need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. You need to come to Jesus tonight. You're backslid away from God. You're, this is for you. You're a church member, but you slid away from God. This is for you. You've never known the Lord. This is for you. As soon as this music starts, step out from your seat and get down here to the surgeon. Sing it right now, Charity, with all your heart. Come on right now. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on, friend. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Everything yes. Yes. Is yes. Come on. Come on. Come on. I, I need the Lord. The I need the Lord. Come on. Of sin come on. My yes. Own. Come on. Right over here. Come on. Right I did not here. Know God bless you. Yeah. Come on. Right in here. Come on. Come on. In the balcony. Let's go. Let's go. I could find a way to heal my wounds. Come on. Yes.
so far away from God, friend. I want to tell you, Leslie, God got you, man. You got a bullseye on your shirt. Look at that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Don't ever wear a t-shirt like that to church, man. I love you, Leslie. God's going to, I can tell God's doing it, isn't he? He's, oh, one of our workers stayed with Leslie right there. I love you, sis. God's dealing with your heart. We don't plan these things, promise. <laughs> you couldn't even think of them anyway. They just. If Linda would come, we're going to give you one more opportunity, and here's what we're going to do. Some of you are so wounded. You got so many arrows sticking out of you, friend. I want to tell you, this is your night. And we're going to have everyone do something. And I don't want anyone to be rebellious about this. Some of you are already coming down. See, y'all are trickling in tonight. You know, if we stayed here all night, there'd probably be four or 500 people come down here and repent. But I'm not gonna stay here all night waiting on you. If you're not right with God, you know you're not right with God. You need to get right with God. It's simple, friend. You're gonna go home feeling miserable. Why go home with all these things sticking out of you? You're gonna lay down in bed. Think of how com uncomfortable that'd be, you know? I'm talking about, I, can you spiritualize that with me, friend? You're in pain spiritually. Some of you can't sleep at night. Why? Because you're guilty. Yes. You turn, you toss and turn, friend. It's because arrows are sticking out all over you. God's got you. This is what we're going to do. Everyone's going to turn to the person next to them. They're going to ask them, do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you tonight? Now, at this point of the service, we have had most, some of the most incredible conversions right now at this time. 
So don't anyone take this lightly. We've had drug addicts get saved during this time right now and live for God. It's been for months now. They're living for God because somebody during this time of the service took the time to say what you're about to say. You turn to the person next to you and you ask them if they need Jesus Christ to forgive them. Don't do it yet. When they do that, look at me, everybody. Don't be a fool, all right? I'm all right. You know, it is silly, but it's really stupid. It's really stupid to say, I'm fine. And they're going, he can remove that. He can heal you. He can forgive you right now. And leave out of this place, friend, a new man, a new woman, washed in the blood of the Lamb, totally cleansed, friends. The wounds healed. The only thing that's going to be left is a scar. Want to know what those scars are for? A scar is a reminder of a healed wound. That's why it doesn't let us forget our past, because that's our testimony. And you can go up to people and go, see that? It's an arrow hole. That's when God spoke to me. Constance, you got that hole in your heart. God went in Birmingham, Alabama. You can always share that story, and people are always going to see that arrow hole where God got a hold of you. Everyone's going to turn to the person next to him and don't, don't you refuse this. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart a minute ago about Steve's dream. And I sense, as the Holy Spirit dealt with me just a few minutes ago about that, that there's someone here that you've got a lot of corrupted flesh because you were shot a long time ago. This thing goes back a long time. And whenever you were shot, involved in that murder, there's a lot of corrupted flesh, and it's almost eat you alive. There's just a little bit left to go. And God brought you here in the nick of time. And the Holy Spirit says, if you'll come up here, tonight that surgeon will withdraw that arrow and healing will begin to take place but for a long time you haven't been able to rest and there's so much corrupted flesh now around you and so much infection it's just about to get you you can't take it and after tonight you won't be able to take it Jesus. so you need to respond that's good no two services are alike so if you think this is a candy cutter or cookie cutter service no friend the things that you've seen happen in this service have never happened before and will never happen again because no two services are alike. And I thank God for that. But this is a custom service for you, friend. You turn to the person next to you, ask them if they need forgiveness. Don't lie. If you do, say, yes, I do. And both of you come down right now. In the balcony, both of you come down. Down on the main floor, both of you come down. Right now, do it. Right now, let's go. Right now, step out. Step out now. Step out now. Let's go. Yes. Yes. Come on. Come on. Yes. Come on. Yes. Come on. Right now. Come on. In the balcony. Let's go. I need the Lord to forgive me. Come on down. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Move up a little bit. I don't want to go in the aisles here. Come on. Y'all move up a little bit. They're in the aisles right here. Move up. Come on. Come on. Anybody else? I'm going to close the altar call. Those of you that just responded, if you believe the Lord can change your life, how many down here right now, you want Jesus Christ to wash your sins away? Raise your hand. Down there. Every one of you down here, raise your hand. You want the Lord to wash your sins away. Look at this, Pastor. You can put your hands down. Look at me, everybody. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. If you're serious with the Lord, he'll be serious with you, okay? God's not playing games in these last days. If you're having a struggle with your marriage, he'll heal your marriage. But we're not playing games with God. We're not twiddling our thumbs. And this revival, we don't take this thing lightly. Pastor, some of you think that we might, we might just be, you know, riding from one day to the next. There's intercessory prayer going on all the time, friend. Right now, there's prayer going on. 
People are laboring in prayer over this revival. There's a prayer meeting coming up Monday night where a thousand people will be in here laboring over this revival. We don't take this thing lightly. Amen. So those of you that have come forward, just remember, thousands of hours of prayer have gone into you. Don't take that lightly. Understand that people cared about you, man. God cares about you. And thank the Lord that he's a perfect shot. Boy, yeah. Boom. Got you tonight, friend. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to wash our sins away. Before we do this, listen up. This is not a churchy prayer. You're not joining Brownsville. You're not joining a Baptist church. You're not joining a Pentecostal church. Those of you that have been away from God, you've known the Lord, you're away from God, if you will admit that you've been a sinner, if those words could possibly come out of your mouth. See, in America, everybody's a Christian. You know? Everybody's right with God type of thing. This country stinks, friend. And when we sin, and some of you are involved in heavy pornography, and you just think it's bad. No, it's sin. It will separate you from God. It's not, well, at least I'm not in the X-rated theaters at night. Who categorized it like that for you? You are going to go to hell, friend. You are in bondage. You are addicted. Jesus said, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. And, sir, you're committing it every night of your life. And adulterers have a place in the lake of fire. So admit, oops, hit anybody? Thank you, Jesus. So admit tonight, we got through this sermon without cut, one cut. So admit tonight that you sinned, okay, when we pray. Everyone pray together with me right now. Right now, everyone pray. Bow your heads. Dear Jesus, once again, dear Jesus, I thank you for speaking to my heart. Thank you for your arrows. Thank you for your word that pierces. It pierces past all my facade. And it goes deep into my heart. And it reveals who I really am. It lit up my life like lightning lights up the sky. Thank you, Lord, for hitting the target tonight. I ask you now, Lord Jesus, to forgive me. I have sinned. I have broken your heart. I've hurt, I've hurt you, and I've hurt others. Forgive me, Lord. I repent. I ask you tonight to be my Lord, my Savior and my very best friend. Come live in my life. Control me. Govern me. My every step is now in your hands. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen.